Hello, and welcome to the second industrial revolution here at Learning the Social Sciences. The Industrial Revolution started in Great Britain, and it started within the textile industry. However, over time, we have steam power coming up, railroads going all over Great Britain, and then transferring over to the main continent. Now, the second part of the Industrial Revolution focused on electricity, chemicals, new innovations within factories, and automobiles. And yes, Germany, France, and the United States caught up quickly to Great Britain due to their ample resources resources available within their countries. However, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe were slower with initiating their own industrial revolution. For example, Russia is not going to industrialize until later in the 1800s, a hundred years behind Great Britain. Now, they do have some reasons for this. They are mainly still an agrarian society, and they don't even free the serfs until the 1860s, which is going to slow them down because they don't have a large and ready work workforce within the cities. Other locations are also just not having the ample supply of resources that locations like Great Britain, France, and Germany do. And so that is also going to hinder their start and progress within the Industrial Revolution. Now, looking at the second half of this Industrial Revolution, we have something that comes in right at the beginning. We have Henry Bessemer creating a new process for making steel from iron. Now, with him, he made a steel that was harder and stronger and lighter, and so it's going to be more useful than iron. It is going to assist in bridge construction, railroads, tools, and to be able to start building some really big buildings. So that is going to help usher in a whole bunch of innovations here within the second industrial revolution. In terms of chemistry, we have Alfred Nobel and he goes and invents dynamite. Now, when he originally invented it, um, yes, it makes a big boom, but he couldn't figure out how to transport it safely. Eventually he comes up with the blasting cap to be able to keep it contained and for it to be able to be transported. And with that dynamite, is going to be used for building railroads, tunnels, and a whole bunch of other items within construction sites. However, it's also used for warfare, which dismayed him and made a lot of people think of him as, well, a pretty evil guy. And so when people thought that he actually died, kind of like nowadays where sometimes on social media, a rumor goes around that somebody has died before they have died. Well, kind of happened noble pre-internet. Um, and he read kind of obituaries of what people thought of him. And he's like, whoa, what is this? And so he then set up the Nobel Prize to really focus on positive achievements. And obviously his legacy for that is still seen today with the Nobel Prize given out every year in numerous different fields. We also have other breakthroughs coming out within chemistry, like Marie Curie making her breakthroughs in radioactivity. In terms of electricity, we have the very first battery getting invented in the early 1800s by an individual by the name of Volta. Then, adding on to that, we are going to have the first electric generators coming up. The dyno machine was invented by Michael Faraday. And with that, we started to be able to, yeah, produce electricity and then make the machines larger and to be able then to get the wiring to then connect the electricity you know, from one building to the next. Thomas Edison then goes and uses that electricity to come up with the very first electric light bulb in the 1870s. And from there, then we're going to be going into a period where we have a little bit of conflict in terms of everything electrical between Edison and Tesla. But that's for another video. In terms of factories, we're going to have new methods coming out. Interchangeable parts have been around since, well, the first Industrial Revolution. We saw that with some of the early plows that were getting invented in the first Industrial Revolution. Obviously, new and improved plows from like your 1200s plow, but we start seeing these interchangeable parts. And they are going to be used here, obviously, in the second Industrial Revolution in a larger manner. Um, now, with this, we are also going to be able to have assembly line production begin where everybody is standing at their position, adding their nuts and bolts to the item that is getting created as it comes on down the line. 
Now with this, we are going to see Henry Ford definitely utilize it with his construction of what will eventually be the Model T automobile. Also for factories, electrical lines set up throughout cities starting in the 1890s revolutionized the factory efficiency as they were now able to utilize electric power to power their plants. It also is going to help clean up the air, which desperately needs it because London cannot continue to live through these thick smogs. Now, the automobiles are also going to be coming out. In 1886, Carl Benz invented a three-wheeled automobile based off of a gas-powered internal combustion engine that Nicholas Auto invented. In 1887, though, one year later, Gottlieb Daimler is going to add a fourth wheel to it and obviously cause, you know, the big boom there with a four-wheel car, which is what obviously is going to really hold on to, you know, the record for most sales. I don't see a lot of three-wheel cars driving down the street. Either way, France and Germany led the way until Henry Ford came out with his car that could go, oh my goodness, 25 miles an hour in the early 1900s, thus revolutionizing the area of the automobile industry. And of course, he's going to make a lot of changes with bringing in all of his interchangeable parts and assembly line production and his concept that he wanted to make a vehicle that even his workers could afford. In terms of flight, in Germany, we have Otto Lilienthal, who was an aviation pioneer and made a whole bunch of flights with gliders. And this information is then going to be utilized by the Wright brothers in America, specifically North Carolina, when they will then make a flying machine that worked there at Kitty Hawk. Eventually, though, we are going to be having commercial flights bringing people all around the world starting in the 1920s. Well, shorter flights first, then they go longer. Before, though, we were connected by airplanes, we do have a growing connection and communication. Samuel Morse made a telegraph machine and set up, of course, the Morse code to help people send messages over distance through a wire with then um, his code. Now, the first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid in the 1860s, and so finally we could have a message coming from the United Kingdom to New York City to really relay some messages. We then also have Alexander Graham Bell patenting the telephone in 1876. So along with those electrical lines going on up for, throughout towns and cities, we are now going to also be laying some telephone wires and telegraph wires. Then in the 1890s, we have Marconi inventing the radio, which of course is going to become popular very fast. Now, looking at medicine, in the 1870s, Louis Pasteur was able to link microbes to confirm germ theory. Now, germ theory has been speculated about for a long time, since even the 1600s, but a lot of people were not necessarily certain about it. And there were some people that, you know, really pushed off the fact that there were these germs that caused all these diseases on your hands and other things. Um, however, he was able to show the link between them. And well, yeah, really just show somebody if you would go and look at it and say, yeah, those are germs. They cause diseases. Um, however, he was also able to create a vaccine for anthrax and for rabies, uh, which, of course, is going to be ha uh, very helpful. Um, Joseph Lister found out how antiseptics would prevent infections. And so he stated that hospitals need to sterilize all their items and equipment and to keep the place generally clean, which is something that Florence Nightingale has also been promoting, stating that British hospitals need to be clean and sanitary. And that is what she picked up from her time serving during the Crimean War. Now, in terms of other illnesses that were going on during the 19th century, we have people living in very poor conditions during the Industrial Revolution. 
And so we have a lot of pollution going on. On top of that, we have cholera spreading through the contaminated water, causing people to suffer from severe gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea. Now, if somebody would catch cholera, the disease would cause a person's blood pressure to drop and they would become severely dehydrated due to, well, all of that diarrhea. The death toll was high with 22,000 people dying in London from 1830 to 1850 and then 23,000 dying in the year 1854 alone. On top of that, tuberculosis, or TB, ran rampant throughout the cities. The disease was causing horrible coughing spells that would result in a person coughing up blood. And around one-third of all deaths in Great Britain from 1800 to 1850 were attributed to tuberculosis. Other diseases like typhoid caused diarrhea and high fevers, while typhus was primarily spread by lice and caused fevers, headaches, and a rash. Now, of course, this is never good. But we do have people in the 1800s that are focusing on finding solutions. Robert Koch was able to find the bacterium that was causing tuberculosis. So we would be able to eventually bring these numbers back down. Uh, Dr. Snow was able to point out water pumps in London that was also spreading cholera. And so eventually over time, we do find solutions to these deadly plagues. In 1850, Paris started an urban renewal project, and Europe starts to follow along suit along with Paris. Cities around Western Europe started to install sewers, they were creating clean water supplies for the people, and they built sidewalks for pedestrians to keep them safe. Now, houses were still cramped and small and not really the best place to be living with it, maybe possibly a larger family. However, over time, the standard of living was increasing and people that may have been, you know, 10 years prior, barely making it now through a lot of um, legislation might be able to have a little bit extra spending cash. So the standard of living was increasing but it's going to take time to go and rebuild a lot of these tenement housing and certain neighborhoods and to get the sewer systems and everything installed. So that was a brief covering of the second industrial revolution. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thank you for listening. Always remember to like and subscribe. Bye-bye.